fine. Uh, we are very happy to have Rocky Coleman and Andrew Long today that will give a, a joint talk, I understand, on the gravitational particle production in the deflationary, deflationary era. Please go ahead. Thanks. Are you seeing the screen? Yes. Um, okay, well, many thanks to Andrea and Newton 1665 for giving me the opportunity to put on my nice shirt, pretend that I've left my house. Um, the Rocky and I had some, uh, Rocky and I couldn't quite agree on who should speak first. And so the resolution somehow was that I would speak both first and last and, uh, and uh, Rocky will make the middle part of the sandwich, uh, the meat of the sandwich, so to speak. Um, the meat. So the plan is, yeah. <laughs> so the plan is I'll talk for about 10 minutes just by way of a general introduction. Um, then I'll turn it over to Rocky for a bit more detail in particular on uh, bosonic dark matter. And then I'll come back in the last 20 minutes or so and um, go into some more special topics uh, for gravitational particle production. So the motivation for both of these talks is a simple observation, uh, namely that dark matter, all of the evidence we have for the existence of dark matter comes from the fact that dark matter interacts gravitationally with visible matter. And this fact lends itself naturally to a hypothesis what if dark matter only has gravitational interactions? So if we were to confront the hypothesis with the data, there's surely no problem in the sense that dark matter is only interacting gravitationally through these various probes shown here, and there's not yet compelling evidence for non-gravitational interactions. The real challenge to the gravity-only hypothesis has to do with dark matter production in the early universe. Uh, can we make dark matter using only gravity? And one could imagine uh, several different possibilities, maybe not as many possibilities as we might have available for uh, WIMP or weak scale dark matter, but um, just to give you a flavor of what people have been thinking about here are a few ideas. On the one hand, we could imagine that dark matter is itself a black hole, a primordial black hole formed in the early universe, which, whose interactions are exclusively gravitational. Um, and could be formed through gravity, through, for example, the collapse of entire Hubble volumes full of matter under their own gravitational pull. Or even if the dark matter weren't a primordial black hole, we could make use of black holes to create dark matter through black hole decay, through the phenomenon of Hawking radiation. This would be similar to having some late decaying moduli field uh, populating the dark sector, but here it's a black hole and gravitational interactions instead. Or moving away from black holes, we could think about producing dark matter through the standard model plasma. Uh, since the interactions are uh, gravitationally weak, we don't expect the dark sector to thermalize with the standard model plasma, but that doesn't prohibit the possibility of a thermal freeze-in in which standard model particles annihilate uh, through gravity. Uh, populating dark sector if the reheating temperature or the maximum temperature during reheating is high enough. But the subject of today's talk um, is instead a different production mechanism, the phenomenon of gravitational particle reduction in the inflating universe, um, which very roughly can be characterized as the amplification of quantum fluctuations of spectator fields um, during the period of inflation and reheating. And I'll make these statements, well, Rocky will make these statements more precise um, when I, uh, in the next few minutes. The uh, basic picture, though, that you should have in mind is the following. We can imagine that we are inflating, and there's some evolving inflaton field that uh, provides a non-zero energy density and gravitates, affecting the expansion of the background space-time geometry. And spectator fields um, that, are conform that are coupled non-conformally to gravity uh, develop time-dependent Hamiltonians. And as we recall from even simple quantum mechanics, um, 
a system with a time-dependent Hamiltonian uh, can be put into an excited state, which in the context of the field theory would correspond to particles being produced. So the first step here uh, is the one that's perhaps most familiar just from GR or studies of inflation. The middle step is the one that we're going to be discussing at greater length throughout the talk. And the last step, let me just quickly remind you how it would work in some analog system in quantum mechanics. So here I'm imagining I have a quantum simple harmonic oscillator with a spring constant that can be made time dependent because maybe I'm heating or co cooling down the coil. Um, so I can prepare the system with a stiff spring and the ground state wave function of my oscillator will be some Gaussian. And if I can imagine slowly uh, causing the spring to become slack, then if I do so slowly enough, the ground state of the system will respond to this adiabatically evolving background, the adiabatically evolving dispersion relation, and uh, track the ground state of the new Hamiltonian. But of course, if I had a stiff spring that were abruptly caused to become slackened, then in a manner of speaking, the ground state wave function would not have time to respond, and the system would now find itself in an excited state of the new Hamiltonian. And this is analogous to what's occurring with gravitational particle production in the sense that it's the evolving space-time background that's inducing a change in the dispersion relation for the fields. And um, due to non-adiabatic evolution, the fields can be put into excited states corresponding to particles being produced. So I mentioned a few other possibilities, and we'll make these statements more precise um, in, the, in the coming next 30, 40 minutes. Um, what I mentioned a few other possibilities for making gravity only dark matter. Um, what makes this scenario particularly compelling? So on the one hand, I would argue that it's unavoidable. It's not a matter of if um, gravitational particle production occurs, but how efficiently it occurs for a given field. Since I'm imagining that all fields are coupled to uh, gravity, as long as they have a non-conformal coupling to gravity, some amount of gravitational particle production will occur. Uh, it's also interesting that the probes of dark matter that interacts only gravitationally aren't, are not the type of obviously direct detection or uh, annihilations at the galactic center that we would be accustomed to thinking about for WIMP dark matter. Or <clears throat> but rather, here the production of dark matter is tied up with inflationary observables. Um, the energy scale of inflation, the tensor to scalar ratio, isocurvature and non-Gaussianity. And so this production scenario has an interesting complementarity with those other uh, more cosmological observables. And moreover, from an aesthetic point of view, there's some appeal to the minimality of gravitational particle production. Um, in a sense, this assumption is highly restrictive. So if I wanted to enumerate models of dark matter in which I can do gravitational particle production, there's, it's just a matter of specifying the spin of the field uh, or more, more precisely the representation of the Lorentz group under which I wanted to transform and picking a mass and effectively I'm done. Uh, if I'm assuming that the field has coupled to gravity minimally, it, once I've specified its spin and mass, the theory is of the dark, on the dark matter side is fully determined. Um, in principle, we can also consider non-minimal couplings to gravity and various options. That, op that opens up more options, obviously. But I'll, I'll be at least focusing on minimal coupling to gravity. Um, now, where the model dependence enters is more so in what's controlling the space-time background uh, on the side of inflation and reheating. There's obviously a variety of possibilities here and still a lot of uncertainties since we don't know much from cosmological observables, um, having only measured NS and AS, the um, variety of possibilities in principle imply one should consider the gravitational particle production calculation anew uh, in each scenario. And I'll talk a little bit about that. But typically the most relevant scales are simply the inflationary Hubble scale. Um, 
and the reheating temperature, where the reheating temperature is relevant for measuring the amount of red shifting that occurs between the end of inflation and today. And so there's a somewhat more um, general connection between these two parameters and the relic abundance of gravitationally produced dark matter without suffering from too much model dependence. But I'll discuss, I'll, I think we'll discuss some of the different um, model dependencies as well. All right, so that was me by way of introduction. Um, I think now Rocky's gonna take over uh, for about 30 minutes and, and then I suppose we'll do questions and then I'll come back in for the last 20 minutes. Okay, thank you. Good, Andrew, good, good introduction. So uh, I thought I would, uh, I've been working on aspects of this problem since the late 90s and I thought I'd just put up on the screen the names of the people I recalled this morning who I've worked uh, on this aspects of this problem with. Uh, I noticed Michael Federke's online and Tony Riotto's online. If I left any of my collaborators off, it wasn't intentional, but please let me know. Uh, so as Andrew mentioned, we are um, preparing a um, review paper on aspects of gravitational particle production in the early universe, and it's coming soonish to an archive near you, any week now. Uh, this is something I've been saying for about a year now, but really any week now, it will be appearing on the archives. So Andrew talked a little bit about the motivation, and the original motivation for doing this was dark matter. The only thing we know about dark matter is that it has gravitational interactions. It's massive and uh, it is stable or has a very long lifetime. I don't think there's any compelling reason to go beyond cold dark matter, non-interacting cold dark matter. Uh, it interacts feebly, if at all, through standard model processes. And in my opinion, there's no compelling evidence for self-interactions. Uh, this is something people work on as an interesting uh, avenue for research, the idea if uh, dark matter has self-interactions, how would the astronomical observables change? We also know that so far, dark matter has cleverly evaded detection. So this leads to the question, what if it has only gravitational interactions? Then you suspect that gravity must be involved in the production of the dark matter. Now, even if it's not dark matter, uh, it will be produced gravitationally around inflation, and it could have late decays and lead to interesting phenomenology, and it could still have a signature in the CMB. And as Andrew said, we can't hide from gravity. Gravitational production is not optimal, and we may as well understand it and explore it. So we're going to assume that the field that's going to be gravitationally produced is a spectator field. It's non-interacting interacts only with gravity, and uh, has no standard model interactions, no direct coupling to the inflaton. And we're going to assume it's not dynamically important in determining the expansion rate of the universe. Uh, gravitational production is inherently uh, a weak process, so it doesn't produce enough of the fields to affect the expansion rate of the universe. It's a spectator field. And I'll go back and forth a little bit about the coupling to gravity, whether it's minimal or non-minimal. Now, an important thing to keep in mind is conformal invariance. Uh, we're going to have a background where it's flat FRW, and uh, flat FRW is conformally equivalent to Minkowski. So if the matter Lagrangian is unchanged under a vial rescaling, the action for a spectator field doesn't feel the expansion of the universe, and uh, will not be produced. So vial invariance improve, uh, implies the stress tensor is traceless <clears throat> and there's no particle production. And a familiar example to people is the Maxwell action. I'm going to assume standard quantum field theory, standard general relativity, and uh, in this part of the talk, I will assume chaotic inflation and Andrew will depart from that when he picks up again. So the usual thing to do is start with scalars as exemplars for this. And that's just a couple of scalar field phi to gravity. And it couples through the square root of minus g, through the metric tensor, and the possibility of non-minimal coupling to gravity through the Ricci scalar. 
and the Ricci scalar is the lowest, uh, this coupling is the lowest dimension, non-minimal gravitational coupling that you could write. So again, the flat FRW metric is conformally equivalent to Minkowski. So if we do a rescaling of the original field phi into some other field chi, then chi obeys a wave equation, but the frequency is uh, time dependent. And the time dependence enters through the evolution of the scale factor. And if uh, it is conformally coupled, if C is equal to one sixth, uh, sorry, if it is uh, not conformally coupled, if C is not equal to one sixth, there is a additional term coupling to the Ricci scalar. So it's a wave equation with a time dependent mass depending on the evolution in time of the scale factor A. And I uh, mentioned vial conformal transformation of the metric. We have to break vial invariance. Somehow this trace of the stress tensor uh, must be non-vanishing. So the solutions to the wave equation include both positive and negative frequency terms. And we can write them in terms of coefficients alpha and beta, but we above coefficients. And uh, if we start in a state where the state is in a pure outgoing positive frequency uh, mode, if that's, if that will remain a good solution if this adiabaticity parameter remains small. So if the frequency changes abruptly with uh, eta conformal time, then the adiabaticity parameter will grow and you will start to populate the other mode. So abrupt changes in the scale factor leads to non-adiabatic changes in the frequency, which mixes positive and negative frequency modes. And we can interpret this at late times as particle creation in the expanding, expanding universe. So we can write the co-moving number density of particles. N is the number density, A is the scale factor. This would be constant at late times in terms of the Bogliubov coefficient. And uh, we're doing a uh, usual Fourier expansion here. And this uh, combination K cubed beta K squared, I'm going to define as N sub K. So we're going to assume adiabatic initial and final conditions, which is true for inflation and matter domination. So you start off um, in inflation with adiabatic initial conditions where you can define what a particle is. And then you end up at late times in FRW, uh, which is um, uh, you can also define a particle. So the idea is to solve the wave equations with initial conditions in the bunch Davies vacuum, where alpha is one and uh, beta is zero. And at late times, uh, late times here being when the conditions are adiabatic, the Bogliubov coefficient can be written in terms of the field and its derivative. So here's a, a little bit of uh, something to think about. Um, we don't know the mass scale of inflation. Uh, in many popular models, it's around 10 to the 12 GeV, rather large. And um, we understand gravitational particle production in inflation is leading, leading to curvature fluctuations. This is the uh, Suzaki, Mukhanov, uh, Kodama formalism. So this is well understood uh, for curvature fluctuations. So the inflaton uh, fluctuations of the inflaton lead to curvature fluctuation, temperature fluctuations, CMB, et cetera. Now, perhaps there are other fields uh, with mass comparable to the inflaton. The mass of the inflaton in most models is approximately equal to the expansion rate during inflation. And if this signals a new mass scale, one of the things we have experienced with is once we find a new mass scale, it's not just one particle, but many particles. So perhaps there are other fields uh, with mass comparable to the inflaton mass, comparable to H. They would also be produced in inflation. So uh, let me talk uh, a little bit about uh, disambiguation. In the original paper, we considered spin one half fields, which are equivalent to conformally coupled scalars. And we found uh, a nice value for omega h squared, assuming that one of these uh, particles is 
uh, stable. If the mass is comparable to the inflaton mass, and you know, maybe 10 to the 12 GeV, and uh, I don't think scientists should use the word miracle, but people always talk about the WIMP miracle. I don't know who started that, but they should be punished. Uh, but this is a Wimpzilla miracle, the fact that you could imagine omega h squared being the value you want for any value of the mass, uh, but in this model, it turned out to be comparable to another mass scale. So if dark matter is conformally coupled scalar or fermion produced gravitationally via non-adiabatic mode evolution, it must be super heavy. And uh, somebody, I forget who, uh, started calling this uh, with the very clever name Wimpsilla. Uh, but it's possible, we'll see, for gravitationally produced dark matter during inflation to have omega h squared in a value you want for masses much less than the mass of the inflaton, especially for spin one fields. So what is a Wimpzilla? Is it super heavy dark matter produced gravitationally or is it dark matter produced gravitationally for any mass? I don't think I'm going to answer that. It's sort of like the question, what is a WIMP? Is a WIMP dark matter with weak scale cross section and masses or is WIMP whatever dark matter turns out to be? WIMP and dark matter are usually used interchangeably now although in the original use was with weak scale cross-section and masses. All right, so there's a 12-step program to calculate the present density of particles produced during inflation. And uh, in the review, we go through this for uh, spins zero, one half, one, three halves, and two. And we start off pr promoting the classical Minkowski action to curve space. Uh, derive the classical field equations of motion, uh, derive the classical stress energy tensor, and as a low technical thing, it has to be the Bellinfanti Rosenfeld stress energy tensor, and calculate the energy density. Uh, express the action in conformal time and define a co moving field to have a canonical kinetic term, derive the field equations, and promote the classical theory to quantum field theory and expand the field in positive and negative frequency mode functions. All this is very familiar and standard. Uh, derive the evolution equations in conformal time <clears throat> for the mode functions, express the stress tensor in terms of the mode functions and find the energy density, set the initial conditions in uh, the Bunch-Davies vacuum, and solve the mode equations and particle creation corresponds to evolution mixing positive and negative frequency terms. Calculate the late time value of the stress energy tensor for each mode yielding uh, the co-moving number density of the field and integrate over all modes and determine the late time number density of the particle. So that's the 12 step program for all these various uh, fields. So um, this is a little notation alert. It turns convenient for me to define a dimensionless scale factor or define the scale factor to be one at the end of inflation. So alpha will be the scale factor divided by the scale factor at the end of inflation. Uh, I'm going to define a dimensionless mass of the spectator field divided by the expansion rate at the end of inflation and a dimensionless expansion rate uh, divided by the expansion rate at the end of inflation. Uh, so I can choose AE times HE equal to one, which implies that the mode K equal to one is the mode that crosses the Hubble radius at the end of inflation. Larger uh, values of K do not cross the Hubble mode, uh, do not cross the Hubble radius during inflation. And for the background geometry and what I'm going to show, I'm going to uh, assume that it's inflation followed by matter eventually leading to radiation. Sometime I will talk about exact de Sitter solutions during inflation where H is uh, a constant and the Ricci scalar divided by the expansion rate is minus 12. The Ricci scalar is negative. And uh, during matter domination, H uh, decreases as A to the uh, minus, as A to the three halves. And the Ricci scalar is also negative during inflation. 
Uh, I'm going to assume chaotic inflation <clears throat> in the numerical results that I'll show. So it goes approximately to center in chaotic inflation. And then it, it transitions around the end of inflation to something that approaches a matter dominated expansion. Something that will be uh, interesting, and Andrew will talk about this, is that during inflation, there's infl uh, I'm sorry, during reheating, the inflaton oscillates, leading to oscillations in the expansion rate. And uh, the Ricci scalar in chaotic inflation is not constant, but has a logarithmic growth in amplitude as A goes to minus infinity. Other inflation models have been studied. The basic idea is robust. There are many more modern, many more modern inflation models out there, and Andrew is going to talk about some of those. So what can we do with this? Um, so there, uh, the one-point function is just calculating the dark matter. Uh, the two-point function of the spectator fields produced is related to isocurvature fluctuations. The three-point function is related to CMB non-Gaussianities. So the three-point function here for the spectator fields is related to, but is not the cosmological collider program, where in that program it's assumed that the field has some direct coupling to the inflaton. You will produce CMB non-Gaussianities even if it does not have a direct coupling to the inflaton. And people since the 90s, late 90s, people have been uh, sort of filling in these boxes. For the review, we want to fill in all these boxes and put everything on the same, uh, on a, a common footing. Uh, and uh, several things are in process now. So for the most part, I am uh, going to be bosonic and Andrew is going to be fermionic. So I will talk about production of spin zero, spin one, and spin two particles uh, because they're sort of connected. And Andrew will talk about uh, the production of fermions. So let's look at spin zero that's conformally coupled with C equal to one six. This is the frequency depending upon the scale factor. And this is some numerical integration of the field equation. And you see that what happens, this is uh, N sub K A cubed, uh, you start off uh, in the, with zero, uh, the beta squared is zero, and then at the end, no, around the end of inflation, you start populating the mode. Things become non-adiabatic, either at the end of inflation, either right before the end of inflation, uh, if the mass is uh, larger than Hg, or just into the matter-dominated era if the mass is smaller. So here the mass is smaller than HE and it's just into the matter dominated era after inflation where uh, things become non-adiabatic. If I would have uh, shown you an example where this with the mass is larger than HE, then it would become non-adiabatic right at the end of inflation. So this is one Fourier mode. We can calculate a spectrum. And uh, this is examples of the spectrum for low masses. And uh, at low momentum, the slope is proportional to k squared. It peaks at m over he of 1 half and then is uh, exponentially damped. So we can also integrate uh, those, uh, that spectrum and calculate the final number density. And this is the result for spin zero for scalars that are conformally coupled. So the co-moving abundance of the particle is calculable just in terms of the mass. In fact, the ratio of the mass over HE. If we want to translate this into a co-moving abundant uh, of the mass density, there's an additional dependence on the expansion rate at the end of inflation and the reheat temperature. Now, we do not know the expansion rate at the end of inflation. CMB limits in simple chaotic models say it's smaller than something like 10 to the 14 GeV. We don't know the reheat temperature, uh, but Presumably, it's larger than about 100 GeV, so we can have some sort of baryogenesis and nucleosynthesis, et cetera. Uh, one, it's 
well known that if the mass is larger than the expansion rate at the end of inflation, then generally this is exponentially, exponentially suppressed. This is in chaotic models. Andrew will talk about ways to evade this. If the mass is smaller than the expansion rate at the end of inflation, uh, shown here, then uh, the, number, the number density it scales as the first power of the mass. Converting the number density to the present value of omega h squared brings in the mass. It brings in the expansion rate and the reheat temperature and uh, scaling to Na cubed over 10 to the minus 5. So if these unknown quantities of He and the reheat temperature are, are of order 1, then if Na cubed is of order 10 to the minus 5 here, then omega h squared would be, 10, would be the appropriate value. So this is, um, uh, you know, then it points to the mass over the expansion rate at the end of inflation of order one. So if this is the way to produce dark matter, it requires a large expansion rate and a large temperature. So these numbers have to be uh, not small, not that much smaller than one. Okay, so things are different if it is a minimally coupled field with c equal to zero, then the um, mode function, the uh, frequency has this additional term that's related to the Ricci scalar. And the Ricci scalar, for instance, is negative in De Sitter. So this is the evolution of a minimally coupled field, and it's different than the evolution of a conformally coupled field. So what happens is you start, uh, this is a graph of chi, uh, chi squared, that's Fourier mode for this value of k and this value of the mass. Uh, it starts, it remains constant, then it crosses the Hubble radius during inflation and grows as a squared until it comes within the Hubble radius and it damps as A to the minus one. So it's non-adiabatic deep in inflation here as the mode becomes tachyonic and there's an eruption and uh, that you find again a suppression in the spectrum for large mass and for large values of K. So this is the uh, spectrum and this is for one value of K in one value of the mass, this is the spectra for different values of the mass and, diff and all for C equal to zero as different values of K. Now you notice that if the, if the mass is larger than two times HE, then the spectrum is infrared divergent. It's infrared divergent, uh, which will end up being a problem for isocurvature fluctuations. So, and if the mass is larger than two, then it is infrared finite. And uh, the green curves here are some analytic approximations that I will talk about in the next slide. So we can make analytic approximations for the minimally coupled scalar by looking in the plane of momentum K, mode function K, and uh, a, the dimensionless scale factor, and whether it is larger than the Hubble radius, smaller than the Hubble radius, or whether it's smaller than the expansion rate or larger than the expansion rate. These are the various regions and different scalings. And you can trace through the evolution for a particular value of k, where it uh, might grow as a squared, then become constant, then damp as a to the minus one. There are some complexities. The evolution is not exactly de Sitter uh, or matter dominated, especially around the end of inflation. And the Ricci scalar oscillates around the end of inflation. And the energy density contains a gradient term and R and H grow as in the de Sitter phase as, as A goes to zero. So following through this program, this is the expected spectrum of of uh, the produced field that it's constant for small k and then damps as k to the minus three as for k larger than mu to the one third. 
This assumes that the reheat value of alpha is larger than mu to the minus two thirds. It's possible that the universe reheats before it enters the, um, the non-relativistic sub-Hubble uh, radius phase. And in that case, it, the spectrum depends upon the reheat temperature, but in this case, it is still constant for small k. So this is the final number density for spin zero. Uh, again, it's uh, calculable, the number density is calculable just in terms of m over h. And to translate into the present mass density requires an additional dependence on h e and t r h. Uh, for m smaller than h e, Na cubed scales is m to the minus one for a minimally coupled scalar. So if this scales is m to the minus one, then to calculate the mass density when we multiply by m, it, um, it's going to be constant independent of the mass. So this means that uh, this would also require a large He and large reheat temperature. So uh, let me then uh, quickly go on to spin one, which has some interesting differences. Uh, so a massive spin one would break gauge invariance, and it's optional to start with the Stuckelberg Lagrangian and Abelian Higgs model, integrate out the scalar, and the Stuckelberg trick leads to, to the De Broglie Proca Lagrangian for a massive spin one field. Now, the big difference between spin one and spin zero traces to the fact that the mass term for spin zero has a factor of g mu nu. And in FRW, this will bring in a factor of a to the minus two. So going through, there are details well known how to do this. A zero is an auxiliary field. There are pos two possible non-minimal couplings that one could add. Uh, decompose field into transverse and longitudinal modes. The transverse modes have exact action of conformally coupled scalar and the longitudinal mode more, is more complicated but resembles a minimally coupled scalar uh, but the light mass is interesting and this was pointed out by Graham, Martin, and Rajendra. So this is the results for spin one. Uh, there are two transverse degrees of freedom, one longitudinal degrees of freedom, and we have to define a new field that uh, will end up having a canonical kinetic term. The frequency squared for the longitudinal degrees of freedom is different than the spin zero uh, minimally coupled field, but the transverse uh, result is the same for a conformally coupled field. This is the evolution in, with scale factor for the longitudinal field comparing the spin zero case to the spin one case. And you see it's different once it crosses the, uh, once it becomes non-relativistic. So this is the resulting spectrum. And uh, it's different, whereas the spin zero spectrum was infrared divergent or at least constant for small k this spectrum decreases as k squared, so it's infrared safe. Uh, right. So we can do the same sort of rough idea of what the spectrum would be by looking at this various, various ranges of k and alpha. And the spectrum again increases, this is if reheating is late, late reheating, the spectrum increases again as k to the minus three as it did for a minimally coupled scalar, and, but then it decreases as k squared in the infrared. If, it, um, if reheating occurs before an early reheating, then it still increases as k uh, to the minus three up until this value of the value of k, but then at, in the infrared, it decreases as k squared. So here, just uh, we can calculate now without worrying about the infrared divergence, omega h squared. And um, 
it's, uh, you, you, again, you can get reasonable values of omega H squared if HE is a little bit smaller than 10 to the 12, or if the reheat temperature is smaller than 10 to the 9. But it's different if uh, it is a early reheating, then uh, calculating omega H squared, it is, uh, depends upon the mass, but now this is 10 to the minus 2 EB. This is Graham, Martin, and Rajendran's result that you can have very light scalars be dark matter if you have um, a, a late reheating. Okay, so spin two, I'll end here with spin two. Start uh, with a Fierce Pauli field. In flat space, there are five constraint equations as well known for the Fierce Pauli field. And this reduces the five constraint equations, reduce the 10 degrees of freedom to the expected five degrees of freedom for a massive spin two field. If you naively promote the Fierce Pauli uh, Lagrangian to curved space, you run into potential problems. One is the discontinuity with GR in the massless limit. Maybe, uh, maybe uh, Weinstein fixes that, but more seriously, you have only four constraint equations, so you're left with too many degrees of freedom. What could be worse than too many degrees of freedom? Well, the unwanted degree of freedom is a ghost. Uh, but probably a while ago, G D G uh, T R G T showed how to construct ghost-free massive gravity, and Hassan and Rosen followed this trend uh, to construct ghost-free bimetric theories, which we want to have for a massive spin two field. And it's complicated. And uh, Andrew and I have started a project with uh, Rachel Rosen to do this. So I'm going to turn this back over to Andrew, I'm not taking his time. I won't talk about uh, isocurvature calculations. I won't talk about non-Gaussianities, but it's interesting. Our goal in the review is to fill in these boxes, calculating the zero, the one point function, two point function, and three point function. So let me uh, turn it back to Andrew. Okay. So thank you very much. So maybe we can take uh, one or two urgent questions, if there sure. are, and then we move to second talk and all the other questions at the end. Okay. Uh, do people ask questions verbally, or do I look at yeah. the? I think verbally. At the moment. Okay. Any questions? So actually, I have a question. So these, uh, these fluctuations are just produced during inflation and evolved, or they're also produced after inflation? In the case of a conformally coupled scalar, uh, it's produced right shortly after inflation during the, the matter-dominated era. It, for a minimally coupled scalar, it's, pr it, it's produced uh, early in inflation. Okay. Now, you can't talk about, you can only talk about a particle in the adiabatic regions. So you can't talk about how many particles are produced in some intermediate region. You can talk about the evolution of the Bogdayubov coefficient, mm -hmm. but uh, where things are non-adiabatic, particles are not well defined. But I'm, I'm wondering if you can uh, compute things like you do in inflation, uh, computing things at the end of inflation and then evolve, or it is different here. I'm sorry, I didn't understand the question. So, so for example, uh, I thought that, uh, so if you, if you talk about inflation and perturbation, okay, so you yeah. can put uh, the, I mean, the quantity, the correlator at the, at the end of inflation, and then you just evolve it. Yes. Okay? Can you do the same here or is, uh, is different? Um, it is slightly different. And first of all, the inflaton is usually assumed to be a minimally coupled field, a minimally coupled scalar field. So the, uh, per the perturbations are produced during inflation and it's frozen until it comes back within the Hubble radius. And the inflaton field is usually assumed to be, have a mass smaller than the expansion rate at the end of inflation. So if it's a minimally coupled field, it um, is frozen when it's outside of the Hubble radius. 
Okay, so here is different in this aspect. Here it can be different. But I thought, for example, in the case of U1, the way they in the paper of Peter Graham, for example, they computed more in a way similar to inflation rather than the volume coefficients. Yes. Okay. You, you can do the same thing. Okay. But they're equivalent. All right. Thanks. But, uh, you know, uh, technically, the best calculation of perturbations produced during inflation are done in the, in the um, Mukhanov, Suzaki, Kodama formalism, which is exactly calculating the Bugliubov coefficients. Mm -hmm. Okay. Other urgent questions? Otherwise, we move to the second part. Okay. Okay. Are you seeing my slides? Um, all right. Well, anyway, thanks. Thanks, Rocky. Uh, so I'm back. Um, so we were asked to provide a overview of the phenomenon of gravitational particle production and its implications for um, for dark matter, um, but also include some additional technical details. So the plan for the remaining 20 minutes or so is to um, give a more step-by-step recipe for doing this calculation with fermionic dark matter. Um, so you could follow along at home in principle. Um, this is part of what will be present in the review based on, based on work by others, um, 98 and so on. And then as Rocky alluded to, I wanted to mention a couple variations on the vanilla setup in which one plays with the model of inflation. Let's start with fermions. Rocky's told us about spins zero, one, and two, and we're going to talk now about spins one half and three halves. Um, so the next few slides are um, a mess of equations, which will be familiar from, you know, quantum field theory 101. Uh, the difference is that we're doing now a Dirac spinner field, but in a curved space time, which is corresponding to an inflating universe. And the goal will be to just to walk you through the various 12 stages that Rocky alluded to of getting out the gravitational, uh, getting out the spectrum of gravitationally produced particles. <clears throat> uh, so here's the covariant expression for the action, covariant derivatives, the space-time dependent uh, gamma matrices related to the inverse Virbein, regular old gamma matrices, Dirac conjugate, we can derive the covariant field equation by varying with respect to psi bar. And we're interested in the behavior of these fields in an FRW space-time, um, which in, print, in, print, in practice corresponds to um, an inflating universe followed by some period of reheating. It's useful to work with a rescaled field variable, which we can call the, the co-moving um, field, scaled out by eight of the three halves. And now the field equation looks like the familiar Dirac equation with the mass parameter replaced by A, the time dependent scale factor times mass. Um, so on the one hand, we can see right away that if the mass were zero, then the field equation would simply be the Dirac equation for massless field in Minkowski space, and uh, no particle production would occur in Minkowski space. In other words, there's no uh, time dependence coming from the space-time background if the mass were zero. Um, and as Rocky already mentioned, uh, essentially what's happening here is mass is playing the role of the order parameter for conformal symmetry violation. One can check this by calculating the trace of the stress energy tensor, verifying that it would vanish when the mass were zero. So we expect that um, for this model of dark matter, the abundance of gravitationally produced particles must be proportional to the mass. So since that field equation was spatially translation invariant and motivates a plane wave on SOT. So now I'm going to call the mode function psi tilde k. And in Fourier space, Dirac equation takes this also familiar form. And as we recall from studying Dirac equation in QFT 101, we, are, we know that this 
equation of motion emits uh, two solutions that can be labeled by the helicity of the uh, spinner field. And so we'll now replace uh, psi tilde with psi tilde superscript s. And moreover, we can parameterize uh, this spinner in terms of C number valued mode functions, chi a and chi b, using a two component uh, helicity eigenspinner h, the, the Dirac representation of the gamma matrices, for example. And now our equations of motion reduce to mode equations for chi a and chi b. As first order differential equations, these two are coupled, and as second order differential equations, um, we decouple them. But these equations should be familiar now um, from Rocky's talk. If I were to ignore this additional i a squared m h factor over here, the equation of motion is otherwise identical to what Rocky showed for the conformally coupled scalar. Um, and moreover, this is the, in terms of my analog with 1D quantum mechanics and uh, time varying spring constant, here the time dependent dispersion relation is um, what's leading to the phenomenon of gravitational particle production. <clears throat> you can think of this as an analog to just the equation of motion for a, an oscillator. So um, with one more step, we get to something that's a little bit more directly connected to observables. So here I'll just rewrite the mode functions one more time. Now chi a and chi b are written in terms of alpha k and alpha, uh, sorry, alpha k and beta k. Um, so just, into, just changing variables into a new set of mode functions. These normalization factors are chosen so that the alphas and betas satisfy a normalization condition that I haven't told you about, um, which follows from quanti the quantization conditions. But, um, Using the equation of motion for chi on the previous slide, we can derive the equation of motion for alpha and beta now, which takes this form, where uh, a sub k is this non-adiapaticity parameter that Rocky defined. It's related to the time derivative of omega k, um, but it's a slightly different formula than the one Rocky presented because of the different equations of motion here for fermions. But it's still telling us about the efficiency of particle production. So for instance, if the universe were not expanding at all, and if h were zero, then the right-hand sides of these equations would be zero, alpha and beta would not change, and no gravitational particle production would take place. Uh, in this model, if the mass were sent to zero, also no gravitational particle production would take place, as we, um, as we guessed a few slides ago from looking at the Dirac equation. So the plan is to solve these mode equations. Um, subject to initial conditions motivated by um, the bunch Davies vacuum. So at asymptotically early times, we require that the mode functions alpha go to one and the mode functions beta go to zero. And at asymptotically late times, the mode functions um, asymptote to the Bogolubov coefficients because of the way that we've cleverly chosen these normalizations. So let me just take a quick aside. We already heard a bit of this from Rocky, but I just wanted to reiterate this important point um, about where the, why the Bogolubov coefficients are showing up. So even more generally, forgetting about gravity and gravitational particle production in a quantum system with a time-dependent Hamiltonian, um, Bogolubov coefficients relate different observers. So for instance, we can imagine an observer at asymptotically early time who has their own set of raising and lowering operators. Uh, an observer at asymptotic at late time does their, their own set of raising and lowering operators. And the Bogle above coefficients relate the uh, two sets of raising and lowering operators, which in this context are particle creation and annihilation operators. But this has the implication that if I prepare the system in the vacuum state of the early time observer and ask what's the uh, particle abundance uh, measured by the late time observer, I'll find a result that's non-zero and proportional to the second Bogolubov coefficient squared. Um, and in fact, the spectrum of gravitationally produced particles is, is effectively just k cubed beta squared. And so this is why we solve those mode equations on the previous slide and look for the late time behavior, read out the Bogolubov coefficients, and thereby get the spectrum of gravitationally produced particles. I'm sidestepping the 
part where you would calculate expectation value of the stress energy tensor. It effectively amounts to doing this. So uh, one can solve those equations analytically or numerically. Here I'm just presenting the numerical results. Rocky talked a lot about the analytic solutions. Uh, so this panel on the left is showing the spectrum of gravitationally produced particles for Dirac fermion um, with mass given by this number here. I'm going to flip the slide and the curve will move. Horizontal axis is the co-moving wave number, so that one corresponds to the mode that just left the horizon at the end of inflation. Less than one means the modes that left the horizon before the end of inflation. Bigger than one means the modes that never left the horizon throughout inflation at all. And as I raise the mass, we'll see how the spectrum changes. So here we're starting at 1 one hundredth of the Hubble scale at the end of inflation, now coming up to a tenth on the order of the Hubble scale at the end of inflation, um, and raising it up to about seven times Hubble scale. The spectrum is generally, um, so here I'm overlaying several different masses, the spectra for several different masses all on top of one another. Uh, this spectrum is generally blue uh, at low K and peaked around the energy scale at the end of inflation with dependence also on the mass of the dark matter. And then there's a sharp fall off for uh, K bigger than inflationary Hubble scale. Integrating these spectra gives the total co-moving number density of gravitationally produced Dirac fermions uh, as a function of their mass with respect to the inflationary Hubble scale. And you can see that we have that suppression at low mass that was expected because M is the order parameter for conformal symmetry violation. And production is most efficient for M on the order of Hubble. From this figure, we can then infer the cosmological relic abundance of dark matter today uh, by including an extra mass factor to calculate an energy density and the appropriate redshifting factors to get from uh, end of inflation until today. So rather than making another plot, I'm just showing you the formula. But for instance, if I'm in a model in which the inflationary Hubble scale is 10 to the 13 GeV and the mass is on the same order, so we would be sitting here in the plot and uh, co-moving density is 10 to the minus three, we would be around here in the plot. I would obtain the correct dark matter relic abundance if the reheating temperature were around 10 to the five GeV, which is, which is perfectly reasonable. Um, so, this is the story for uh, spin one half uh, Dirac fermion. Um, do you think we should go through the whole thing again for spin three halves? Well, we won't for the sake of time, but um, I'll quickly remark on some differences and refer you to either our, our review or these extremely nice papers um, that discuss the issue in the context of gravitinos. Now our spinner field carries an additional space-time index and the covariant action requires some extra gamma matrices um, covariant field equation takes a similar form to the Dirac equation but with the extra gamma matrices. There are four equations here. Mu is the free index and um, there's four uh, spinner fields which are labeled by the space-time index but the Rarita Schwinger spin three halves field should really be describing just two pairs of particles. The plus and minus three halves helicity uh, particle and the plus and minus one half helicity particle. So it seems like there's too many degrees of freedom, and of course there are. Uh, not all of these degrees of freedom are dynamical. For instance, you can see that this object here is totally anti-symmetric, and so we won't have any term like uh, time derivative of psi zero. And so psi zero is not a dynamical field, it's an auxiliary field in the same way um, that for a spin one, um, spin one field, A zero is also auxiliary. So in fact, there's two constraints hiding in here. And with a clever parameterization, we can um, obey the constraints and extract the uh, physical dynamical degrees of freedom. Um, so here, psi tilde is the mode functions for the plus and minus three halves polarization. Uh, and psi tilde, this second one is the mode functions for the plus and minus one half polarization. So we note that the plus and minus three halves polarization, its mode equation is identical to the one that we derived for spin one half field, the Dirac field. And so we don't need to do any new calculation. Gravitational particle reduction of these helicity modes is equivalent to what we've already, what I've already shown. On the other hand, the plus and minus one half modes, helicity modes, um, have a 
different structure. So in particular, if I were to send the mass to zero, uh, CB is sent to zero, but CA is not. And so we expect that the production of the plus and minus one half helicity modes is not suppressed at low mass as we saw for the Dirac fermion. And this was utilized in a couple of papers in 99 um, to discuss efficient gravitino production in the early universe. But for the sake of time, that's all I'm going to say about this topic. Um, one can look out for our review where you'll also have some nice plots to show. Um, I wanted to move on to the next point discussion which is varying the model of inflation. So um, up until now, everything we've been talking about is in the context of m squared phi squared inflation. And here's a nice uh, summary of results for different dark matter models, the scalar and vector models that Rocky talked about and the Dirac fermion or Majorana fermion that I was just talking about. Um, you can see they have qualitatively different behavior at low mass, depending on whether or not M is an order parameter for conformal symmetry violation. But they have a universal behavior at high mass, which is that there's an exponential suppression over here. And the question is whether that exponential suppression <clears throat> is a general phenomenon in gravitational particle production, or is it unique to M squared phi squared? Or under what conditions do I expect the gravitationally produced particle abundance to be exponentially suppressed when the dark matter mass is above the inflationary Hubble scale. So in this section of the talk, we're going to first understand why that exponential suppression arises, and then we're going to discuss a class of models that evades the exponential suppression and would allow for a more efficient particle production when the dark matter mass is above Hubble. So it's not hard to understand why the exponential suppression kicks in for for m squared phi squared inflation, here's the same mode functions we saw earlier. In fact, these, these are not the ones for the Dirac fermion. These are the ones for a conformally coupled scalar, but it's the same structure as the ones I showed earlier. Uh, remember, A measures the non adiabaticity of, of mode K. That's related to the derivative of um, omega, which is given by this expression. These equations simplify in the regime of heavy particles, so if the mode is non-relativistic, I can approximate omega as just A times M. And if particle production is inefficient, then beta will be small and alpha will be close to one, which was, which was set by the Bunch-Davies initial condition. And in that regime, the mode function, the second equation uh, can be written in the form shown down here, in which, um, which takes this form of a Fourier transform. In other words, beta is essentially the Fourier transform of the Hubble parameter um, evaluated on a time scale, which is one over the dark matter mass. And now we can understand how the exponential suppression arises. If the Hubble parameter is changing slowly so that its Fourier transform doesn't have any support at uh, one over mass, then the Fourier transform will return to me uh, exponential uh, at e, to the minus m over, e to the minus some number times m over Hubble. So what's missing in the m squared phi squared model of inflation is that the Hubble parameter is changing too smoothly. What we would like to have is a model of inflation in which the Hubble parameter has some rapid oscillations in it as well. So to avoid the exponential suppression, we can imagine a two-scale model of inflation, like a hybrid inflation or hilltop inflation, um, in which one parameter controls the Hubble value of Hubble, and a second parameter controls the oscillation time scale for the inflaton field. Um, in such a regime that the oscillation time scale is short compared to the Hubble time because the inflaton mass is large compared to the inflation and Hubble scale. Then the evolution of the Hubble parameter would look something like shown here, that there's a slowly varying piece, which is roughly just tracking a to the minus three halves um, during this effective matter dominated period of reheating. But on top, um, an appropriate rescaling of H highlights the, um, the oscillating component. So on top of that slowly evolving component, there's also a rapidly oscillating component. So these two scales now act as essentially an IR and a UV cutoff, um, so that if I have a model of dark matter in which the dark matter mass is uh, somewhere between the inflationary Hubble scale and the inflaton mass scale, when I do this Fourier transform, now the Fourier transform has some non-zero support on time scales of order one over the dark matter mass. And in this way, the exponential suppression is avoided and replaced by a power law suppression instead. <clears throat>
So in a paper with Dan Chung and Rocky a couple of years ago, we um, laid out so a very technical longish paper. Um, we laid out a systematic approach for calculating Vogelbach coefficient analytically um, in a regime where the geometry has some slowly evolving piece and some rapidly evolving piece, which is smaller in amplitude than the former guy. And rather than going through the details, I'm just going to present the main results here. The, we argue how the Vogelbach coefficient can be approximated um, in terms of just the rapidly varying parts of the Hubble parameter and the Ricci scalar. Uh, this is written for a um, scalar field with a non-minimal coupling to gravity parameterized by xc. And um, this takes the form of a Fourier transform shown at the bottom, where now h tilde is the Fourier transform of, um, of h. And for a given model uh, of inflation, one could calculate these Fourier transforms and then from this expression, evaluate immediately the corresponding Vogelbach coefficient, um, which then it gives us the particle density of gravitation induced particles, which is k cubed beta squared. So we also do that to provide an example. We do that um, with a simple two field model of inflation, uh, motivated in part by the work by these authors. And um, the results we found are shown here. So the first formula is the same formula for relic abundance that you've seen in both my talk and Rocky's talk. The quantity of interest is this co-moving number density. And we've calculated the co-moving number density um, in a generic model of inflation where the dark matter mass lies between inflation Hubble scale and inflaton mass scale, which sets the time scale for oscillations. And for either conformally coupled scale of dark matter or minimally coupled scale of dark matter. And the key point here is simply that the exponential suppression that one would expect naively for dark matter masses above the inflation Hubble scale is here avoided. The exponential suppression does kick in for dark matter masses above the inflaton mass scale um, because that original argument I presented when the exponential suppression is, arises would, would apply. Um, but here we've treated that exponential, we've, we've just written this as a step function instead. Um, okay, so the the message here is that with variations on the model of inflation, one can obtain qualitatively distinct uh, behaviors, particularly in an interesting regime where the dark matter mass is not uh, fixed to the inflation Hubble scale as, um, as, as Rocky motivated, but rather uh, may be allowed, could be allowed to be much larger. How much time do I have? We should come to the end quickly. Right. Okay. Sounds good. So I'm going to skip then the last uh, bit of this talk. I, I did want to highlight some ongoing work with my student, uh, Siang Ling, here at um, Rice University, but I think you may have to wait until um, the paper comes out uh, later this summer. But the, the gist of the story is that we, you know, both Rocky and I have been talking about a model of inflation that's already ruled out, m squared phi squared. So let's consider gravitational particle production in a class of models that's, um, that's obviously viable and provides a useful benchmark for um, new cosmological probes. Uh, these are the types of potentials that flare out uh, into a plateau rather than just remaining a parabola. You can go through the gravitational production calculations uh, Siang has been doing. And, um, and if you're interested in these results, I'd be happy to talk about that a bit more. But um, you have qualitatively similar behavior to um, what we've discussed previously, but now with some additional dependence on this free parameter alpha that lets you dial the, the shape of the potential from being um, more like a parabola uh, to uh, more flared out. Okay, and I also uh, quickly wanted to mention um, that of course with these short talks, we don't have time to do justice to the um, huge amount of interesting research into dark matter from gravitational particle production that's been going on recently. And I wanted to highlight the work of a few authors, some of whom I think are in the audience here today. Um, so this is my last slide. Um, the takeaway from the whole uh, pair of talks is the motivation that dark matter arises, dark, dark, evidence for dark matter predominantly comes from its gravitational interaction. So it's reasonable to ask the question, what happens if dark matter only interacts gravitationally? And the phenomenon of gravitational particle reduction provides a natural explanation uh, for dark matter production in the early universe. And this will be what we've talked about today is um, summary of 
results that um, for the large part have been established in the literature for some time. We're trying to collect these things together um, to present as an overview and status update in a review article. Um, and the highlights from this talk is, uh, you know, it's, it's also well known as I, as I said, uh, gravitational particle protection is also viable for fermions. Interesting distinctions between spin one half and three half fermions based on where the conformal symmetry violation is coming from. Um, models in which, two scale models in which rapid inflaton oscillations enhance the gravitational particle protection um, in the regime in which dark matter mass is a lot larger than Hubble are interesting to explore as well. And um, part of the reason for writing the review article is to provide readers with a toolkit for doing these types of calculations themselves. And we've been applying those tools um, with Xiang Ling and Rice to study alpha attractor models uh, this recently. So, okay, thanks again for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, so we have some time for questions. If you have a question, just to speak up. Hi, can I ask a question? I'm Tanmay Vachaspati. Uh, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Hi, Andrew. Uh, so in the fermion production, uh, does the Pauli exclusion principle come in anywhere? Sure. Um, I didn't mention, um, I didn't really get into the quantization just for the sake of time, but these mode functions alpha and beta are, and must enforce a normalization condition, which is that alpha squared plus beta squared is one. It's not possible for beta to become arbitrarily large. Uh, that's different from the bosonic case that Rocky had presented in which alpha squared minus beta squared is fixed to one. And in principle, they can both become quite large. Um, so um, so if that, that does provide a cap on the amount of particle production that, that can take place. Mm -hmm. But right. it depend, whether or not the cap is relevant depends on the parameters. I see. So about this graph, actually, what's the kink at... Uh, m by h equal to two in the right hand plot. Yeah, this is also related to what I was talking about with um, high mass. So essentially that's the dark matter, uh, that's the inflaton mass scale um, oh, okay. for, um, for this particular model. I'm normalizing here to the uh, energy Hubble scale at the end of inflation, but it happens to be related by about a factor of two um, to the inflaton mass scale. So there's a threshold effect happening there. Similar to the threshold effect, I you can kind of see it in these plots. You see here, as I go from 1.8 to two, at high K, uh, something has turned off. Um, mm -hmm. You can also see it in the figures that, um, in the alpha tractor model here, the, this is just below the threshold and this is just above the threshold. And so the population high K is turned off. And this is associated with the, the type of rapid inflaton oscillation scenario I was describing. Right, thank you. More questions? Uh, can, can I ask a question? Sure. So I have a question about the minimal, uh, minimally coupled scalar with mass below the hyperscale during inflation. So what is your thought on the user misalignment contribution to dark matter? Um, I think this was, are you asking me or Rocky or? Um, <laughs> I, see. I mean, I think this came up, uh, David Curtin had asked in the chat about um, what sets the IR cut, when Rocky was discussing minimally coupled scalars, what sets the IR cut off, so. Um, uh, no, 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 well, my question is about the misalignment contribution. But do you, just you mean gravitationally induced misalignment the, or? Uh, no, 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 just the one, which just, comes as a result of small mass during inflation? Uh, one could imagine that the misalignment is induced by this phenomenon of quantum fluctuations of the, of the scalar during inflation. That would essentially <laughs> correspond to the contribution of the spectrum with such low K that it's still outside the horizon today. Um, which is how I understood uh, David's question. And so then there, there is a contribution there as well, um, which, is, um, which is not being captured by these calculations. Um, mm -hmm. Is that what you have in mind or you're just talking about 
misaligning as an initial condition. Uh, yeah, by, it just misalignment as a yeah uh, initial condition because if the I mean, mass is small and there's no nominal coupling, so there's no reason that scalar should be just sit still at the minimum of the potential. And we may you know have a displacement as well as a fundamental scale of the scalar. Um, so, I mean, if you're asking whether or not that I wish I should have listed that among other models of only gravitationally interacting dark matter, then I suppose we could we could include that here as well. Um, but I guess I'm saying if you want to have a if if you you want to have a story for how the field became misaligned, and I'm saying one one possible explanation is the same phenomenon of gravitational particle reduction and quantum fluctuations of the scalar field that we've been talking about here. Um, but then there's of course other mechanisms for inducing misalignment as you, as you know very well, as you've studied. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if I fully appreciated the question um, or if I've addressed it satisfactorily. But. I was just worried about you know, predictability of the scenario when, because if we have you know, additional contribution of which in general not, not suppressed, so mm -hmm. there, there may not be a strong connection between the observable and uh, you know, minimal dark matter scenario. Oh, I see. You're asking whether it's dominant, whether the misalignment contribution is dominant or not over the contribution that Rocky presented. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that, yeah, that's a bit harder to say. Um, yeah, that's a bit harder to say. Yes. I mean, I think in the context of these fermionic models, you don't have the same issue with um, lots of power at low K, right? The spectra are blue. So you avoid this ambiguity. There's, there's no analog of misalignment production here. It's okay, but you could ask the same question in inflation. No? So why is it different here? So inflation. To inflation, it seems similar to me. Uh, sorry, in the case of inflation, we do assume that you know, inflaton is just displaced from the minimum. I said, what, 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 what was your argument about in inflation? Mm. Oh, just that the field has a fluctuation which is of order of H, and uh, so here is uh, somewhat similar, I thought. Yeah. During inflation. Then what happens later? I'm not sure. I think. Oh, okay. okay. Mm. Yeah, th thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. More questions? Hi. Uh, hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, so, uh, so I I have a curiosity. So, uh, so will there be any other probe of uh, such uh, dark matter? I mean, the, uh, gravitationally produced dark matter other than the radix density? Um, well, as Rocky alluded to, or did Rocky, do you want to handle that? You mentioned isocurvature and yeah. Gaussianity. So, um, there's, there's two possibilities. One is just the zero, uh, the one point function producing dark matter. Mm -hmm. And then there's uh, the possibility of isocurvature contributions that would show up in the CMB. That, that would be the two point function and uh, non-Gaussianities that can be produced, you know, the, the three-point function that can also show up in the CMB. So if it has no interactions other than gravitational, then probably the CMB would be the place to look. There have been some work about very massive, uh, you know, Planck scale particles, detecting Planck scale particles in direct detection experiments mm -hmm. uh, through a, um, uh, transfer of a momentum. Uh, this presumably has a mass smaller, much smaller than the Planck scale. So there's, it, it would be very difficult now to see how to do that. So it's either CMB or some sort of direct detection that we will have the instrumentation sometime in the mid 22nd century. Okay, okay. So I, I, I was just uh, wondering, uh, will there be any effect on, let's say, propagation of uh, the initial tensor perturbations produced during uh, in, in inflation? 
I, I didn't understand the, the question. I was just wondering, suppose you have uh, initial denser perturbations uh, produced during in inflation, and then uh, during the propagation of this tensor perturbation from initial to now, due to the gravitational production uh, of this dark matter, will there be any effect like uh, like some uh, some uh, blue tilting or red tilting of the spectra? I don't see why there would be, but maybe I'm missing something. I mean, the energy carried by the dark matter is extremely small compared to the oh, energy okay. of the infoton. So, okay. Okay. The, I mean, you have, I guess the dark matter gravitates, but it's, but that contribution at this time would be quite small compared to the huge, enormous energy in the infoton still. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So, can, can I ask a, a, a last question? So, about the, the U1, the massive U1. So, if you realize the massive U1 with the Abelian Higgs model, uh, does it change completely the conclusion or, or not? Well, the, the massive spin one, one model we looked at was just the uh, uh, De Bruyne Proca Lagrangian that you could get from. Uh, some uh, using the Stuckelberg trick, hmm. um, but we assume that the scalar in the Stuckelberg trick is just integrated out. Yeah, but so since, uh, since the scale of inflation is very high, okay, if you realize uh, the massive U1 uh, is continuous symmetry breaking, uh, then uh, the symmetry will be restored, uh, and so. Naively, I would think that the conclusion is completely different uh, from uh, from the one of the Proca Lagrangian. Is this correct? I don't know. I, have, I haven't thought about that. I, I see Andrew's nodding his head. Oh. So maybe I mean, I think if you, if you're in the regime where the symmetry breaking scale of Hebelian Higgs is small compared to the inflationary Hubble scale, then you would think of it just as a symmetry the symmetry being restored during inflation, yeah. um, and then you would have a massless vector and a complex scalar and the complex scalar would experience gravitational particle reduction the massless vector would not so much okay so, so then it's just a bit uh, a very special feature of uh, you know massive u1 uh, which is uh, uh, i don't know right. yeah you need the normally you need Hubble's massive u1 from spontaneous symmetry breaking it's true that for massive u1 uh, you may consider just putting it like a, a mass but uh, I don't know if it's really physical. Yeah, I mean, in the context of a billion Higgs, I would say that since you have the additional degree of freedom that the Higgs, you would want, um, you want to want to be in a regime where the inflationary Hubble scale is small compared to that symmetry breaking scale and the mass scale of that new degree of freedom. Uh, and then one could ask whether or not that's the most well motivated regime to be in. Um, All right. So, uh, if there is no other questions, uh, I'll thank you for your very nice talks. Uh, there is a question? Yeah, yeah. So, I just wanted to comment on, I actually asked that, 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 I mean, following on your question, huh? can one think in this case the Goldstone theorem to work? Oh, like, uh, yeah. Can one expect that the, 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 the complex scalar production, production after this? Spitry is broken would be the same as the longitudinal mode uh, uh, vector dark matter. I don't remember if Rocky said this, but effectively that's that's what's happening, right? The transverse polarizations of the vector um, are conformally coupled to gravity, but the longitudinal polarization is, is an Eaton Goldstone boson in the context of an Abelian Higgs model, which was a minimally coupled scalar. And mm -hmm. so that's one way of understanding why particle production for that degree of freedom is unsuppressed as you send the mass to zero, but there's some Goldstone boson equivalence theorem that applies. So, so should one also worry about the, let's say the radial mode, or, or how, how does that uh, evolution would happen? I mean, because Proca well, is very different. 
Yeah, the radial mode, that's what I was trying to um, answer just a moment ago, that we are, if the radial mode were lighter than the inflationary Hubble scale, then you'd have to talk about that as a new degree of freedom. You'd have to integrate that into the theory, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So the calculations that we're talking about here, Rocky presented, have assumed that if there is a radial mode, it's heavy enough to be neglected. It's heavier than the inflationary Hubble scale. For the model, that, uh, so you realize the, the mass for very, so the, that matter is reproduced for very low mass, no? Mm -hmm. So, uh, if the, the vector mass, if the breaking is spontaneous, you would think that you restore the symmetry. Uh, so you not integrate out the, the radial. Well, well you're, we're in a regime where the gauge coupling is. You have to be in a regime where the gauge coupling is really tiny, and the symmetry breaking scale is really high, and uh, I think the scale itself. I think they're really different models. So, so. I mean, there is not much room because, like, your inflation scale is very high. And the mass is very, very low. So you the have vector to take mass it, it is infinitesimal at that point. You have to take it small, yeah. I mean, yeah, if you want to reach, say, part of the motivation for that study that Rocky presented with Peter Graham and company was to explain ultra light dark photon dark matter at micro electron volt. But they, they need a Hubble parameter of 10 to the 13. So to make that particular model work, you're at a, if you have a, in a billion Higgs, you're in the regime where the gauge coupling is whatever that is, 10 to the minus 30 or something. Exactly. Uh, the gauge coupling is 10 to the minus 30, the VEV is 10 to the 13, and the scalar self-coupling is order one or something. Um, so, so that particular regime, you know, then you have issues of, do I like having this tiny gauge coupling? Yeah. But it, you, know, you could also be in this regime here where there's not such a- I'm not saying it's a Can you consider you one with the, you know, dead constant mass, okay, but the, it seems like uh, not continuously connected to a billion Higgs model because the, the answer is completely different. It can be very different. Well, it's, it's connected in the limit. Isn't it connected in the limit that the vacuum expectation value goes to infinity, the gauge coupling goes to zero, but the product is constant. I mean, that, that is the limit that's, uh, that ends up with the Broca-Lagrangian. Uh. Yeah, that, that may be a silly limit to consider, but that's, that's the limit that gives you the proto Lagrangian. Okay. It's not also correct to say that the results are completely different because if the scalar fluctuates a lot, then you have a variance of the field of the scalar and that will uh, induce a mass of the, to the gauge boson as well, which will right. be order of H again. Yeah, but for example, it will also depend on whether the scalar is uh, uh, conformally coupled or not. So, I mean, I, I think I can get many things, you know? Of course, if it's yeah. not, then, then the results are trivial in that sense. And also, like, if you want to send the value to zero, it means you have, you know, the mass term, the quadratic term, it goes to infinity, so it's a... So, so uh, Michele and Tony are pointing out that we could have chosen to make it much more complicated. <laughs> and uh, so our, our goal here, for the review is to do something that's sort of general and simple and as a launching point for people to consider things uh, like you're talking about. Okay. Well, I appreciate it. I just to just to understand. All right. So I think uh, that was very interesting. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you for organizing. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.